Expect the best used car deals guaranteed. Visit arnoldclark.com. Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show, sponsored by Arnold Clark. I'm Peter Martin, Alan Ruff, Stevie Naismith, and Hugh McDonald here with me to look back over last night's fixtures and also look ahead to the weekend's football and some of the stories that have emerged today in Scotland and beyond. Uh, you can hit the follow on our Facebook. We'd be delighted if you could do that. Share it with your friends. And also, if you're on YouTube, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Get that bell going so that you get the notifications of when we are offering you some unique unique video content. That said, great to have you on board. If you've got any messages, by all means, uh, give us your thoughts on your favourite team. So, last night, Rangers edged it by a goal to nil, Ruffy, but it wasn't without controversy. Um, not only was Steven uh, Gerrard double yellow card for a red card in the end, um, but also, over and above that, real questions over the penalty that uh, Alfredo Morelos was denied. Yeah, uh, that's. I think uh, Beaton's the only one that can describe, you know, what he saw or what he didn't see. You know, I, I think he was in the first instance. I think he was maybe cajoled a wee bit the way Morales went up in the air and fell down. But when you see it again, there's, there's a definite contact with the goalkeeper's glove. Uh, I think it's his boot that catches his glove. Uh, and I think once you've seen it two or three times, if we go with the contact, there was contact, and it's a penalty. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't buy into the argument, Stephen, and I've never bought into the argument that somebody's reputation goes before them because referees should look at the incident as they see it. Yeah, they should. Um, I think from watching the game, John Beaton's position, you could argue, isn't great for seeing the uh, the contact. So then he's relying on his, his assistants that are at the side of the pitch, which... I think when you can see the pictures, you can see them kind of mouthing about whether they've seen it or not. And mm. it's the one where they've obviously not seen it clearly enough. So they've gambled that in the safe side that, oh no, no penalty and went on, um, which again has been a, a wrong decision. Um, everything that unfolds after that is a consequence of the bad decision. But I must say, John Beaton as a referee is a good referee. He... He's on the same level as in terms of players. He understands the emotion in their game. But this one is literally just a bad decision that it's too late to rectify and then it explodes after that because of that. But at the end of the day, I would say it's the whole refereeing team rather than, than the one man. If uh, Obviously, he makes the call, but he's relying on his assistance, for, especially for them where the ball's going through and he's behind play. Yeah, well, um, Stephen Gerrard, the Rangers manager, didn't miss him last night. Well, it's, it's a blatant penalty. It's a stonewaller. Um, and I'm someone who wants to support officials because we're all human and we'll make a mistake. But what I can't stand for at this level is three three people making the same mistake. They've all got clear views at it. I could see it and I'm the furthest away. There's three officials at this level who all get it wrong together. I can't have that. I asked for an explanation. He refused to speak to me. I asked him for an explanation. And the explanation I wanted is why have three people missed a blatant Stonewall penalty? Not one, because I'll go with one. I'll go with a mistake. We're all human, we all make them. But I can't have three at the same time that are all looking at the instance. Yeah, you can tell he, he's an angry man with that one, Hugh. No surprise. Yeah, I think he's right to be angry. There's three, I mean, there's three possible decisions uh, there. There's a penalty, there's no penalty, and then there's no penalty with a dive. Uh, on top. Um, John Bean just got it simply wrong. I mean, if he if he'd have gone no penalty, you could I think it was a penalty. But if he went no penalty you could say, right, okay, you know, that's um you know that that's not the biggest mistake he's ever going to make. But no penalty plus a dive is is a bad error, uh, Peter. You know, that shows to me, he's not getting much help from the his assistant referee and from the fourth official. It suggests to me he's taking a bit of punt on it as well. Um, and it also adds to this thing. We've been talking about it for, for months on the show. The, the, the refereeing hasn't been great in Scotland. It's been poor in Scotland this season. And I think the, the pressure in Crawford Allen, head of referees, or head of the refereeing development of the SFE, has been 
uh, has been lessened by the fact there's not a title race. Because see if there was a title race, some of the decisions over the last couple of weeks in particular, there would have been, I mean, all over the shop as far as headlines are concerned. Yeah, um, the dive now, uh, that yellow card, Ruffy, they're going to appeal it, and rightly so. <clears throat> yeah, I think they should appeal it. You know, once you see it two or three times, uh, you can see the goalkeepers come out, and instead of pulling his hands out the road, he's left one of his hands in there, and uh, Morelis' boot has touched that, you know, and, uh, and, and and that's why it should be a penalty. But I, 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 I agree as well. I think the referees have got a hard job with these situations now because they've got to get it right. I've, I've, you've heard me two or three times saying that the, there's too many players out there, you know, trying to con the referee into it. And uh, the one that springs to mind, uh, and Stevie's on the show just now, the the one with Queen of the South, where the, the, the boy just puts his foot in against the other defender and trips himself up. Uh, and it's a penalty kick. You know, it's a really difficult one to shout unless it's really, really clear cut. And it's make it harder and harder for the referees if some players are going to do that. Yeah, well, uh, Jim Goodwin was speaking today ahead of uh, the weekend's football and the St Mirren boss clearly um, reckons the ref will know he's made a mistake and he'd obviously like to see some changes himself. But I don't see why we can't have our own system here in Scotland where you know we can have a, a TV monitor at the side of the pitch next to the dugout and for those particular incidents where you know it's penalty incidents, it's very easy to stop the game, the referee run over and have a quick look at it and then go back and, and give the correct decision. I mean, it's not too difficult. Uh, I mean, that, that in itself yeah, I, uh, I is said, a Peter, but we, time. we discussed it, Peter. There was a clip in an American football well, they had TVs behind the goal. It doesn't have to run to the halfway line. Just put one behind the goal. Mm. And then he just walks over there and has a look at it. Uh, because if he puts it at the halfway line, you'll have everybody looking at it. Well, he'd be mm. yeah. buying tickets to see it. You know, well, in the halfway line with the this, people that's there. I think part of this as well is the amount of cameras at each stadium. But I think <clears> if you have some form of camera that can get mm -hmm. most of these decisions angled and get the correct decision, that's an improvement from where we're at. So mm -hmm. if we get that stage, then further down the line with investment, you could potentially get a full VAR system or something of the likes. But to just rule it totally out, I think it's going to end up costing, like Hugh says, at the moment it doesn't cost big because there's not a title race, but mm. wait till the decisions happen and maybe a relegation mm. or a, a title is mm -hmm. at, at stake for it. Yeah, I mean, on that point, uh, on that very point, it, you don't need to have the full Buna. You don't need to have the whole, mm. you know, the whole, uh, mm. you know, um, team elsewhere. I can't remember what's the name of the the, the place in England where they St George's the, Park. St George's mm. Park. We don't need to have that whole um, system in place. You could have quite simply um, a director who is able to um, rewind that the twenty seconds mm. to give you that angle on the camera uh, from. The team at the ground, and it's especially for what six Premier League games. Um, mm. I think it's. I think some form of it will come in. Um, the other aspect of this game, two things that still uh, we've got to discuss. One is Steven Gerrard let rip at John Beaton, and John mm. Beaton responded with two yellows. Um, the manager could face a ban, but I, I don't think he's too bothered. I'm not worried. I'm, I'm looking forward to beating St Mary. That's my only worry. Only worry if if someone wants to stop me being on the side of a pitch. Don't worry. I'll I'll celebrate when the time comes. Don't worry about that. Yeah, he's only four points away from it now, Ruffy. You, mm. you know, you can smell the title. Yeah, I mean, why? Do you, quite correctly, why get involved with it? You know, it, uh, it's done and dusted, uh, and move on. There's bigger things. Uh, around the corner, so why let that spoil a, a, a good win? Why let, let it spoil the games that are coming up and the celebrations that are coming up as well? So, no, I think he's been very good in, in dealing with that aspect. Yeah, uh, of course, Livingston almost got themselves a point in the end. It was the late, late show, and Alfredo Morelos certainly had the last laugh on it. Um, Livy battled away, and with that contentious issue, uh, David Martindale understands why it was a frustrating night for his opposite number in the Rangers' dugout. I was delighted, but I'd be, I'd be the same. I'd be the same, of course, you understand. Your emotions in football, especially, are chasing. Is it title 55? I've not won the title for 10 years, so 
to be that probably John's no John's no made a bad he's made a bad decision, but he's no meant to make a bad decision, but obviously your emotions take over at that point in time, so I can understand one hundred percent these frustrations. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you, Stephen. I mean, I know it's not exactly popular opinion, but um, he is a thoroughly decent guy, and I think he's the best of um, the bunch of referees that we have. There are a number who, you know, maybe don't actually get up to his standard, but I think overall he's a good referee. Yes, I think, and I, I find as a player, somebody who understands the emotion in the game, the uh, the speed the game goes at, what is a foul or whether somebody's it's a 50-50 let the game continue where mm. the, all these small things make a good referee um, somebody who you can speak to on the pitch and understands it that, that's good on top of obviously making the right decisions but again in Scotland refs get absolutely battered and scrutinised more than arguably in the English Premier League um, but that's just because our focus every day of the week is on football in Scotland because it's the biggest sport and there is so many folk invested in it. Um, so that their job is really tough. Um, and it goes back to the, the same old, give them as much help as they can because realistically, Scotland having full-time refs is further away mm -hmm. than a bar system coming in. Um, mm -hmm. So they need to get as much help as they can. Yeah, absolutely. We're calling for all these things, but they cost a bit of money, and money is in short supply. Um, in the other match, it was Hamilton Aki's one, St Johnston one. You'll be a happy man, Ruffy. Did you not suggest it was a draw uh, yesterday on the yes, show? Yes, I did. Uh, you can tell by the smile on my face. Uh, I did uh, <laughs> predict 2-1. Uh, uh, I thought I was very fortunate. Uh, I, I thought the boy was offside, just, just offside, but... Uh, I won't let that stop me getting my five points. But uh, a terrific goal for Hamilton, you know, and I think Brian Rice thought that was it. I thought uh, that was enough. And uh, I think one of the one of the players had a tremendous strike against the, the post any other night. Maybe I went in. So I think these clubs, as I've said, are just happy with points just now. You keep picking up points in every game and you're going to survive. It's when you don't pick up any points at all. You know, that's when you struggle. And I think we'll, we'll see that on Saturday, Ross County and Kilmarnock. Because if one of these two don't take any points, I know there, there'll be consequences. Yeah, I think, Hugh, for Hamilton, um, Bruce Anderson and Callaghan have been the star men. I mean, if, if anybody mm -hmm. else scores that goal last night, we would have been raving about it. It's mm -hmm. a Hamilton Aki's player who's curled it into the roof of the net. It was top drawer. Absolutely top drawer, and 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 the great thing about Hamilton is they've got you know I think they've got a, a couple of really decent recruitments at the right time. We all know to go down the familiar road. We know that I always think you know they're the relegated team because of their um, and just simply because of their budget, and and they should be down the bottom of the league. Uh, but I think at the moment um, they be they're just nicking points here and there. Ross County got that really important result against Celtic. I think Kilmarnock now are looking um, very, very vulnerable. You know, um, uh, they're right at the, uh, they're right in the mire at the moment, and I think they're looking very vulnerable. And they really need. I mean, it's all cliche, but they need a result very, very quickly. Yeah, on that game last night, Stephen, and you'll appreciate this. Although Callaghan's goal was brilliant to watch, great finish. I enjoyed the other goal. Brian Rice thought mm -hmm. it was offside. Yeah, really He's mentioned mm -hmm. it. Ruffy's mentioned mm -hmm. it, but. To actually, Melamed's first touch is immaculate before he hits the second one into the net. Yeah, I, I think watching the goal and <clears throat> the first touch being that good, he knows what he's doing. But as the ball's coming, he's got an idea in his head, right, it's touch and then hit. Because the, the second, the actual strike comes very quickly after his touch. It's, he understands that the defender's closing in and he needs to get the shot off. But fantastic touch. And then to just, uh, once that initial touch is made and he sees it's a great touch he knows that there's only mm -hmm. going to be one outcome that's going to go in the back of the net but yeah it's, it's probably just not enough for St Johnston when they're trying to push for this top six but um on the back of their week they'll be they'll be pleased all round with with the the week's work yeah four points as you can see from the premiership table for Rangers now uh, to win the title and at the battle for third uh, is certainly interesting. Hibs certainly with that game in hand 
will think they're in the box seat, but roughly at the bottom, <laughs> at the bottom end, <laughs> I, I, you know, it's it's tough to call. I can't I can't pick out of the the three of them, despite the fact that I I did suggest it would be Ross County at the uh, start of the season. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting when the split comes. You know, obviously they've all got to play each other, and uh, I don't think there's much between any of the the, the bottom. Uh, clubs. So again, it will be on the day. It'll be which one of these teams can pick up maybe six points or whatever, you know. But uh, I think the games are all going to be exciting. I think that every every player will know that there's something to play for, and uh, nobody will want to be in that team that drops the division. Yeah. Did you give us your prediction on it, uh, Stephen? Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, but I think it will be either Kelly Ross County or Hamilton. Uh, <laughs> but no, uh, on that, I think going back to Kilmarnock, I think since Tommy Wright's came in, there has been an improvement in their performance. But like you said, they need to get the result that will give them that kind of stepping stone to push mm-hmm. on. Because I agree, they're the ones that are in free fall and haven't seen many, many points recently. And, and then on top of that, the, tops, the bottom six games, I think every season, the thing that goes unnoticed slightly is. In the fixtures, any draws are killers for their teams down the bottom. Mm. The, 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 at the moment, it's good picking up points, but then these bottom three teams, see when you get in the bottom six, you need the three points to make a real difference because a point here or there ends up dragging you down, down, and before you know it, yeah, mm. it time's up. Yeah, the only problem I have with Kelly, um, Stephen, is the fact that Tommy Wright has mentioned, you know, and, and a lot of people are looking to Kyle Lafferty to be some sort of saviour. He looks lively since he's been uh, back in Scottish football, but it's a, a lot of pressure on, on him to fly the flag. As, um, but the big man, has he deals with that well. He's that type of player that, whether he's been out for a period injured and he comes back in for a game... There's an element there that you fancy him to score a goal. Um, uh, the things that he will bring, even though I think his match fitness will be quite a bit short because he's not played loads of football, but he'll work really hard for you. He'll give you his all on a Saturday. He'll go on the pitch and if he lasts 60 minutes or 70 minutes, he'll give you his all for that. And he's got that composure in the, in the box. He, he gets a goal at the weekend that's offside, but he's in that position to be reactive, to get on the ball and, and score. So mm. I think there is a lot of pressure on him, but there's not many in the Premier League who like that pressure more than, than, than Lafferty. Yeah. Uh, over the last few days, Ruffy, you've been at the forefront of our um, topic of discussion, which is, of course, uh, League One and League Two. Um, they've been, they're still chatting at the moment. They've basically... Um, been replying to the SFA's suggestion of an 18-game season. Uh, this is what uh, they had to say on this whole issue. Um, it's uh, today, as a United group of 20 clubs, we've advised the SPFL that we plan to resume our season on the 20th of March, which is good news, uh, with an immediate return to training this week while complying with the testing regime. We accept a 27-game season is no longer open for us due to the timing of the return. The SPFL's preference for us is to complete an 18-game season, and we understand why. It is the easiest option with less pressure on the schedule and no need to change the length of the season. Um, The consensus amongst the 20 clubs is that a 22-league season is the preference, uh, with a split in each league after 18 games, followed by four further games. It allows a competitive end to the season uh, that our fans are keen to see and we want to participate in. We receive money to test and allow us to keep playing, and that is what we want to do. COVID may play its part, but with the same testing regime and protocols as the Championship and Premiership, we are in no worse position than they are. Uh, And it goes on uh, to say... Uh, in this one, that to complete a 22-game season will mean extending the season to fulfil all fixtures, including those that have to be rescheduled. But this is possible without impacting on anyone other than Club 21, and that's ninth in the Championship, who will have to wait a maximum of two more weeks for the playoffs. With all that has happened to League 1 and League 2, and nothing that is in the 
gift of the SPL board to grant, uh, uh, and noting that, um, I beg your pardon, that it is in the gift of the SPFL board to grant a short extension as almost 30% of the SPFL, we want them to uh, see this work with an increased sense of urgency to find a way to make it happen. We are calling on the SPFL to do everything in their power to work with us to overcome the perceived obstacles of a 22-game season, which all have solutions and hopefully they will respond accordingly. What's your gut feeling, Ruffy? Will they? Uh, well, as you said, uh, at this moment in time, they are debating it uh, as we speak at SPFL board level. Uh, I think uh, the first and second division teams are all hoping it's the 22. Uh, I think it's an equal number. I think that means everybody will play each other twice, mm. you know, and that would be good. Uh, I just hope they don't come up with something that goes to a resolution where we need a vote, and that could sort of uh, drag things on a wee bit further. But I think the most mm. important thing is we're playing. Uh, and I think that's everybody wanted to play. I don't think there was anybody come out and said we want null and void or we don't want to finish it. So I think that's a good thing. The players will all be keen to play. Uh, they'll all have been trying to keep myself fit at home. So the sooner it all gets out there uh, and we all know when we're starting and how many games we're playing, uh, we can all deal with it. But it's just good to get football back on again and uh, I'm sure the players will be happy with that. Uh, I'd like the SPFL to pull out all the stops, Hugh, because I, I feel as if not mm. only party thistle, but you've got to feel for the players across both leagues um, for this long, long wait. Absolutely, and 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 uh, you know, I think that it was a very good statement there. I think it was uh, very reasonable, uh, and uh, I think we all want the SFA on board with this, SPFL on board with this, so that we can uh, move forward, get the football played, and get some kind of Get some sporting and, uh, and, and competitive uh, results at the end of the season. You know, the season that will be hopefully that will be defined by competition rather than by an action. Yeah, um, I, I've got to ask you, Stephen, uh, uh, just before I get your thoughts on your heart, your uh, chief executive's uh, statement on the fans, which is clearly a worry. Um, and Budge out with the dreaded vote of confidence for the manager after only eight months. I mean, I can't believe she came out with that line. Are you, are you boys in trouble, or is it just a just a little mm. blip along the road to the title? Uh, no, I think it, it, it's just been a blip. I think the last three results haven't been good enough. Um, two of which the performances haven't been good enough. So I think it's a bit of that and the way the seasons went and the way everybody thinks the season should go and will go. Um, combination of all that. But from the manager down, we know that the results, first of all, recently haven't been good enough. But again, there's been a couple of what I'd call lazy performances. Um, we've had too many players just slightly off off the boil and um, maybe just expecting it to happen. So it's the ma the manager's been good in the last week or so to, to rectify that and can I get a collective understanding that we're in a very good position, but we need to go and finish the job off and, and win the games we need to, to win the, the title. Um, yeah. That is the main aim and it's the thing that we're here to do. I need to pick up on that point though. I mean, why, why do you think so many players players that have struggled to settle, players that are off the boil, players that maybe think they're taking it for granted. That's a worry. Um, I, I, when I say take for granted, I, I'm meaning within the game that the, the, there might be a, a subconscious feeling that ugh, we've got such and such in the team who'll, who'll score a goal or a moment of madness, uh, magic that, that'll get us through the game, that kind of thing. Um, but I think... Uh, there was a few boys come in in January who maybe have taken a wee bit of time to settle and the team's rotated slightly on that basis. Um, so there's, a, there's an element of that, but look, that, that isn't an excuse. The, the results haven't been there. Um, two of the games have, have been in away performances, which, again, are slightly different than, than when we're playing at Tynecastle in the familiar surroundings. Um, but... It, at the end of the day, these teams are going to go and make it difficult for us and then try and counter us with, when we kind of take bodies forward and up the pitch. But in, from our point, we've probably lost sloppy goals. Um, and that's not just individual errors. It's, it's been the setup of the team in, in specific times in the game. So it's about just being diligent in all these small things to, to get us back to kind of winning ways. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it should be a good game. Um, but I, I'm just looking there, uh, Hugh, and uh, it's Hearts against Dundee, which is uh, mm-hmm. going to be a cracker uh, as well. And of course, if Wraith win their two games in hand, um, mm-hmm. you know, obviously they've got the postponed game uh, against Infermon, that's now off. But if they won their two games mm-hmm. in hand, suddenly squeaky bum time. Yeah, um, in, uh, to be frank, Peter, I, I think Hearts. I mean, it's not the, the biggest prediction in the world, but I think Hearts will win the league, and I think they'll end up winning it pretty comfortably. I think the, the real uh, intrigue in the league will be uh, the playoff positions, you know, who who starts to negotiate uh, for them. I think uh, I was really impressed with Dunfermline at the beginning of the season. Um, I watched them and thought they were a real workman-like, well-drilled team. Wraith Rovers uh, have had some spectacular results. They look at a, a, a good team as well. Dundee have had a sticky season, Peter, but they have, they should be, they should be in that mix. So if you're asking me for, for, for you know, my views on that championship, I think it's, I think it's the playoff race that's interested, and of course, you know, it really matters. You know, finishing second because you don't have to pay that you know extra around the games. Um, so that's what I would be concentrating on at the moment. I think Wraith Rovers, I've got a chance of that second place as well. Yeah, Wraith Dunfermline, Queen of the South, uh, and uh, in the mix uh, is uh, Dunfermline. Yeah, Dundee and Queen of the South. Um, I've got to mention to you though, um, Ruffy uh, and Bunch uh, did suggest that she thinks you know it could be. Could be the end of 2021 before we get any fans um, back in the ground. Possible looking to 2022, um, the way things are going. But that would just drive yeah. you insane. I think she's just been realistic, Peter. Uh, I think there's too many things still ongoing. There's we've got the Dunfermline game cancelled because of COVID. And we don't know what's around the corner. So I think it's better looking at it from that aspect and fearing the worst and maybe the worst won't happen and maybe it will get better and better. But you can see where she's coming from. You know, there, there's so many things going on with the COVID, you know, and although it's getting better, uh, it's not where we want it. Uh, there's still people dying, unfortunately. So, you know, I think she's just looking at, at the series side of the game and, and once when we do come back, that we come back uh, better than, than what we have been before. That's why... We keep discussing the Euros and everything about fans going to that and everything. I, I, I just can't see that happening at all. You know, travelling in particular. And I, I see UEFA but now beginning to ask clubs, you know, uh, they, they definitely want people at the games, mm. you know. So now they're putting pressure on, on organisations to say, yeah, if you have it at your bit, then there's going to be fans in it or we'll take it somewhere else. So that's a bit of a worry as well. Mm. Do you think we're going too slow, Hugh? Are we being overly cautious? No, I don't think so. Um, uh, I know that's not the answer a lot of fans want to hear. But I just think there's so many people died from this. I just think there's there's dangers with these uh, mutant core, uh, you know, variations on it. I don't think we're out of the woods quite yet. I think you're always better to be more cautious uh, than, than, than overly uh, bullish. I know that I know that you know will cause its own problems. I know that you know um, I believe that next season is going to be the season when it really hits home for clubs. You know, in terms of finances, um, I think clubs have staggered through this season and done done so well to do so. But my short answer is that I would have rather err in the side of safety. I think a lot of the problems with COVID for the last year have been caused by people being too bullish, you know, let's get back to the help out, let's get back out into the sun, let's get blah de blah de blah, and that, that's my own personal view. Yeah, I, I mean, the biggest problem with that, Stephen, is finances. You know, there's only so far, I, I'm amazed we've managed to get this far without some clubs just actually saying, look, the game's up. Um, I, I mean, that has amazed me. But now to get to a situation where you're yet again asking fans to, to somehow buy into a virtual season ticket. Yeah, that, 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 that is it. I'm, I'm with you in this in terms of uh, it's staggering that there's not been more clubs um, struggling much worse or, or it's came out. I know there's been a few clubs asking to defer wages and, and take cuts, but 
on the main, and that that maybe goes for the the loans the government provided, and also the grants in the lower leagues. But yeah, it, it, it is asking the fans, but I think the fans are probably the least, or that's probably the most likely source that clubs are banking on because the fans are everything to to the clubs in Scotland. So they will back the clubs. They'll they'll help as much as they can. It's it's that revenue out with that that there is no substitute for. Um, mm-hmm. That's really, really holding the clubs to ransom in terms of not being able to get any income from that. And that's the part that, like Hugh says, we're now effectively going over the year mark. And for the first year, everybody's got that feeling of, oh, we'll do all we can. But that can only go on for so long. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Scunnered is my favourite Scottish word that I think everybody I've spoken to is uh, not only at Scunnered, some are actually beyond Scunnered now uh, with it, um, but um, we need to be resolute in our safety precautions. Um, let's hope there is no club fall files of, um, you know, financial uh, problems that uh, mean they can't go on. I certainly thought that was going to be the case uh, almost a year ago when the red flag was up for this uh, terrible disease. Um, This is a a day when I'm sure if it's your birthday, you want to celebrate it, you want to get all your mates round, you want to (coughs) get your family and celebrate it. If it's a special one, if it's a 70th one, and you're one of the greatest players ever to play in Scotland, it's ultra special for Sir Kenny Dalgleish. So Kenny Dalglish has turned 70 today, let's have a look back at his glorious career. Dalglish began at Celtic where he spent seven years winning nine trophies and scoring 112 goals in 204 games. This prompted a move down south to Liverpool where he was signed for a record £440,000 to replace the world-class Kevin Keegan. Dalglish formed an iconic duo up front with Ian Rush and was the star of one of the greatest teams of all time, he was dubbed King Kenny. In 13 years at Anfield, he scored 118 goals, lifting 20 trophies along the way, including six league titles and three European Cups. He was named Liverpool's greatest ever player before managing the Reds and later Blackburn, winning four more leagues. He's the top scorer in the history of Scotland's national team, tied with Dennis Law on 30 goals, and is the record appearance maker with 102 caps. He played at three World Cups. Dark Leash will forever be known as one of the greatest ever to play the game. When you're a wee boy, Stephen, and you see a guy who just does things that make you actually fall in love with the game and you want to go and see him play and you get so excited, um, that's how I felt when I watched Kenny Douglas. He was an absolute genius, um, not only passing the ball, but um, scoring goals. And he always, this is the thing I liked about him, Stephen, he always looked Mm. as if every goal he scored was the first goal he'd ever scored. Mm. And the smile on his face was unbelievable. Yeah, he's somebody I, I didn't see too much of his career, um, obviously growing up, but it's something that most of the coaches, staff that I've came across, whether it be in away with Scotland, down at Everton, even in the city of Liverpool, um, asking who the best, for instance, the, the Scotland coaches and uh, older players, who's the best player for Scotland ever? Kenny's the, the one name that pops up the most. You'll have the odd person who picks somebody else, but I think everybody knew he was on another level compared to the majority. Um, and what he's done in his career shows that. And then on the other side of it, from my time at Everton, the the respect he has from everybody for what he's done, not just for Liverpool, but the community and everything beyond that, the, the hills by disaster and all these kind of things, he get the respect of a full city there and, and just as much as he has of a full country <laughs> up in Scotland. Yeah, I mean, that's the that's the other element of it that I think uh, is well worthy of, of recognition as well. Uh, you know, as a person and what he went through, um, you know, when he was manager of Liverpool was, was incredible, Ruffy. But the whole city of Liverpool, uh, totally and utterly, red or blue, embrace him for making sure that he... I mean, I, I don't know how many funerals he went to for Hillsborough, but it was just, it took its toll on him. Yeah, it certainly did take its toll on him, you know, and I think you're talking about, I think he went to about 90 funerals, you know, and I think that's the, that's the kind of target we're looking at here, you know, and you, you know yourself when you go to funerals, it's not the happiest place to be at, you know, and uh, you can see it did affect him, uh, there, there's no doubt, you know, that uh, for two or three years it did, uh, and uh, but he came back, uh, as you said, and 
you know, that smile that you, you were talking about there, it, it was evident right through his career. I mean, I had the privilege of playing with, I think it was a way back, I was with Partick Thistle Reserves, I, I was 16 at the time. Kenny was farmed out to Cumbernauld United and uh, we played them at Cumbernauld United's Park. And I remember that smile on his face three times that day. Uh, and he rattled three by me. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and it continued right through the career. We played under 23 together. We played in the full squad together. Been to World Cups together. And, it, and he's just a legend. You know, and he, as you say, even in training, when he scored a goal, it was as if he'd scored a goal in the European Cup final. Uh, that's what it meant to him. Uh, and I think a lot of modern day strikers should take a, a leaf out of his book. You know, there's, there's a lot of them don't celebrate goals the way they should celebrate them. And that's what it's, that's what it's all about, having the privilege and the, the gift to score goals. You should celebrate it. And I think I think the, the, the most memorable one for me is the one against Bruges when he jumped, yeah. jumped to Hordens. And uh, the smile on his face then was just unbelievable. But that's the kind of guy he was, you know, uh, and, and, and legends are, you know, up there. And he certainly is one of them. He's, he's far, far up there. Yeah, I like his patter as well. He's got a really brilliant, dry sense of humour. Mm. Um, I, like I like a good noise up with him. We've had him on the show, uh, I think, three times um, over the years, uh, Hugh. Um, Ruffy mentioned mm. goals that he scored. I mean, for me, the goal he scored against Belgium was absolutely no. unbelievable. And after he'd scored it, at the end when he was interviewed, they said, you know, mm. you've just scored you know, one of the top goals. Um, of that particular season, and he said, "Well, mm. it, it, it didn't. It didn't matter. We lost three two. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very. Like, he actually scored two great goals that night, Peter. Um, yeah, I remember a goal as. I remember a, a goal against Spain as well. Volley from what uh, old timers call a shy. Uh, um, um, he see the great thing about Kenny is I don't believe he was a centre forward. You know, that no. sounds amazing. Should, 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 that may be shocking, but the amount of goals he scored. Kenny, when Kenny was with Celtic, Kenny played uh, basically 2 to 11, right? He didn't fancy going in goals, but he played 2 to 11, in that he would come back to whoever's in goal and pick the ball up and generally work his way up. There's a goal against, I think it's Motherwell, uh, Peter, where he picks it, you know, he goes back, gets the ball, and he plays, plays a series of one twos. Then just hammers it into the net, you know that kind of best boy in the school school playground kind of goal, you know. Um, uh, but at a mark, I mean, that, he's a guy who could have played centre mid, no bother for for you know he could have played alongside soon as Liverpool and centre mid, you know, great yeah. pass of the ball, great vision, great strength. Um, yeah, I, I, for me, he's the best, and in, in, you know that Scotland's produced Peter. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, an all-time hero, Ruffy. Is it, is it sad that I, uh, as a as a as a primary school boy, used to have scrapbooks of him, and now, you know, as a, a an older boy, I've got a Kenny Douglas room. Is that sad, Ruffy? <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. You just you just identified a, a great player through through the the eras, mm. you know, and he, he's done everything. You know, we're talking about Liverpool, about Blackburn, and Newcastle, mm. and everywhere he mm. went. You know, he was he, he was yeah. a success. You know, and uh, mm. I mean, I'm sure Graham will have been in touch with him. They were big, big mm. pals right through all the Scotland scene. They always shared the room together. They always went about together. Unfortunately, mm. the two of them just drank champagne. Well, we were all drinking pints mm. of lager. Uh, that's mm. that's that's the way they were. And, uh, you know, <laughs> he, he was just a terrific guy to be about. But mm. no, if yeah. you're interviewing him, you're right. No, if you're trying to get a line <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, just no. as soon as you mentioned he was sipping champagne there, uh, you know, Nasey could relate to that, by the way. He knew right away, uh, you yeah. know, the rest, the, the rest of the boys in the hearts, the rest of the boys in the hearts yeah. dressing room are, are drinking a, a bit of bitter or a, a pint of heavy, <laughs> and there's, there's the champagne Charlie there. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, nowadays it's, happy it's, it's Hooch. It's Hooch and Bacardi <laughs> Breezers nowadays. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and for the benefit of people who haven't been in a nightclub for about a year or a pub, uh, yeah, Hooch, um, that's a great one. Uh, anyway, happy birthday to uh, Sir Kenny Dalgleish. Hope he has a great day. Um, whatever his family have organised for him, I'm sure it would have been bigger, um, the celebration and the get-together, had we all been allowed out. Anyway, apart from anything else, um, Kenny was great to watch Kenny's team's 
um, that he managed mm -hmm. were great to watch as well. I mean, he built a side at Liverpool with Barnes and Beardsley, um, Ray Houghton, that was absolutely superb. Hansen was still there. They were mm -hmm. unbelievable as well. Um, they were worth watching. However, Manchester United, uh, Ruffy, it's going to take me to the end of the season, but I'm not going to turn the telly on when United are on. They are absolutely dire. Last night, I don't know why I fell into the trap, but they were terrible. Yeah, I, I, I thought there was a stage maybe a month ago, I thought they were going to kick on and be the stars of the season. You know, they certainly had all the young players coming through and uh, doing remarkably well, but I think Man City has just put the pressure on them. I think Manchester City have just turned the screw and they've not been able to live up to it. Uh, I think they're now playing pressure football <laughs> rather than the relaxed football they were playing when they were winning week in, week out. But now Man City are just head and shoulders. Yeah, I don't think they're too far away mm. from the title. Um, but even Leicester now have started to make it an interesting race, mm -hmm. uh, Hugh, because Man United slipped up, Leicester slipped up against mm. Burnley. Mm. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I think uh, Man City. I mean, I don't think Man City's home and hosed. Um, they've got, they've just, uh, they've got the best squad. They've got the best players. They're, they're just moving into a nice gear change where uh, they're playing really well. That's fine. The big, um, the big uh, question in England is, uh, you know, Champions League places, Peter, uh, and a lot of scrambling about the year because remember Champions League places you know are very very important not just financially uh, uh, or even for the, the sheer elitism of it or, uh, but they're very important in attracting players as well and there might be a few players that are up for grabs in the summer uh, that will only go to a Champions League club uh, so if Manchester United uh, want to in any way have uh, ambitions to you know to to, to stay at the, the very top of football. They've really got into those Champions League places uh, to attract reinforcements. I reckon they, they really badly need reinforcements as well, Peter. Uh, it might sound daft after all these nothing each games, but I really think uh, it's centre back is a problem. I, I really believe that centre back is a problem that and everything stems from there. And the fact I think that they should make a decision on De Gea and go with Dean Henderson. Yeah, interesting times. Um, some people are thinking they should make a decision on whether the manager stays, but that's another point. A um, couple of things. Neil Gray, uh, more often than not, always brings up some nice points that are worthy of discussion. Uh, Stephen, concussion substitutes. That's something that I think will be welcome for a number of um, players, the chance to actually just make sure they are safe going off and the other player comes on. Is that a good move in your mind? Yep. I think it is. I think it's a sensible one. It's a, uh, it's the least likely to impact on a team performance on that day. Because um, I think it's been us. I think again, with the more research it's done, the more um, issues further down the line. I think it's proven to show that it's causing. Uh, so I think this is a good way to, first of all, like I said, not impact the performance straight away. But a player's mindset if they go down and. I've only experienced it once in my career where I landed awkwardly. I kind of took a whack from somebody in the shoulder, landed awkwardly, and kind of was a bit dazed. The physio comes on, and he's like, oh, you're right, and uh, as you do, because you're wanting to play as much as you can. I'm fine, I'm fine. Played on for five more minutes, and then it, my vision was really blurry. I couldn't understand. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see the ball all the time. And then I started thinking to myself, what am I doing here? I didn't understand why I was on the pitch. So, mm. again, physio comes on. And it's a, the, the physios and guys like that are waiting, or have been waiting for you to make the call because it's obviously your body knows how you feel. But it does, it's come to the point where it does need to be taken out of players' um, mm. hands for their safety. As uh, I, At that time, I didn't really... A physio comes on when you get a whack in the head and you're like, he's like, do you know where you are? <laughs> And every time a physio said that to me, I look at them as if they're stupid. Like, I, I do know where I am, but this one time I did understand after that that for the next two hours I couldn't understand why I was at the stadium. So um, it does have massive impact. So it's much, much better for everybody all around. That's yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's interesting listening to Stevie with the symptoms there of a head. Now, I was feeling that in Argentina just at the, 
the Peru game when I think I got a wee kick and for yeah. 10, 15 minutes I was just mm. didn't know where I was, you know, it was just yeah. Yeah. Just brought it all back. That that's happened a few times in there. your career. <laughs> yeah, I was just it's, about, it's, I was just about to say, Stevie, somebody must have kicked him in the tunnel before he kicked off against Brazil. Um, uh, <laughs> he, didn't, he, didn't, he, didn't see, he didn't see Zico, he didn't see it there, he didn't see Malcao. <laughs> Right, I was Obviously. only joking. You don't have to start throwing in games left, right, and centre. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, Neil also, I mentioned there, Neil Gray mentioned the point here, Hugh. This is a good one. We're always, because we're in lockdown, we're always looking for something uh, to try and occupy our minds. Um, somebody suggested to me the Tyson mm. Bruno uh, documentary is mm. worthy of yep. watching. And also there's another one coming out, Hugh, that I'm, I'm going to watch because I, I thought he was a wonderful player. It's called The Divine Ponytail, 26th of May. It's, uh, out. it's uh, of course, the documentary on Roberto Baggio, who I thought was a sensational player. Well, he, he was, wasn't he? I mean, I, I just watched him. I mean, I'm I'm one of these very sad people that's just got you know sports programs on all day, and there was a, a program on one of the satellite channels there that uh, they just call it the football years, Peter, and it takes us back to the 1994 World Cup, and and you watch it and and you see yourself if people talk about penalties and penalty shootouts and what they can do to people, but the two people that missed the penalty were Barresi. And and, and and Baggio, and you go, and Baggio's penalty was like a mile over the bar, you know, just like a completely unlike Baggio thing. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I remember the goal was against the Czech Republic in, in, in Italia, was it Italia 90, that one where he, he came in dribbling yeah. in, Peter, and scored from there. I love that. I would also say, if people are looking for anything to watch, there's a, a Pelly documentary as well on Netflix. Um, uh, which I really enjoyed as well. Um, uh, I think, you know, greatest player in the world, he's in, he's certainly in the argument, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. I watched it two hours of absolute joy. Um, Stephen, I, I don't know if I've asked you this before. I mean, we've all got our heroes. I was talking about Ken Leash. Lots of people um, are actually mentioning who their heroes um, were on uh, Facebook and, and YouTube as well. Um, Growing up, was there, a, was there a foreign player or a, an iconic player that you always loved that was maybe out of left field that nobody would have thought of? <laughs> One for the pure, I don't even know. <clears throat> uh, grow, growing up in the early years, Brazil were the unbelievable team, but I had this fascination with the centre-half, Junior Baiano. Uh, mm, I couldn't wow. tell you too much about him, but for some mm. reason, I just constantly... <laughs> Any time I was playing in the garden, I had a Brazil strip and I was junior Baiano. It was a six foot five centre half, I think. <laughs> yeah, and, and you've clearly mm. built your whole game around that from now on, then, haven't mm. you? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know why, always... but I just I love watching Brazil growing up. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, mm. and that brings me nicely to the, cha the difference in cultures, Ruffy, um, over the years. And you've known it time and time again when you've come up against Brazil. I think it was in the 1998 opening game of the World Cup and Scotland are playing Brazil and the ball comes out of the air. It's about 50 feet in the air and it comes out of the air in the first five minutes of the game, Ruffy, and Cesar Sampao takes it on his chest and in one quick movement plays a 20-yard pass out to the right-hand side mm. uh, to another Brazilian and the Brazilian team move on in their attack against Scotland. And then five minutes later, a similar ball comes 50 feet out of the air uh, towards Colin Hendry and he just thumped it right back into Rosette. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, think that was, I think that was a sign whenever you play that team, uh, if they sent a half could pull the ball down and start, you know, playing it out. You know, that's when you knew you were in, in a bit of bother mm. because if a centre-half had that much ability, I'm sure mm. the players in the forward areas were a lot better than him. So I think <laughs> always thought you were, you, you were in for a bit of trouble. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, OK, who, give me your predictions then, guys. Liverpool-Chelsea is clearly the game to watch tonight. Um, I'm going to go mm. Liverpool 2-1. Stephen, that's my heart ruling my head. 1-1 uh, draw. Mm. I thought it might be. Hugh? I don't see Chelsea getting beat. I think they'll either draw or win. I think Liverpool are are struggling a bit. I think Chelsea are coming strong. I think Tuchel will get much more out of this Chelsea team than Frank Lampard did. So I fancy, I fancy Chelsea get a result tonight. 
Yeah, Ruffy, is it Sir Kenny celebrating or is it the Blues who'll be happy? Yeah, I'm going to sit in the fence in this one. Like Stevie, I'm going to go for a one each draw. Yeah, don't worry about it, Ruffy. One each is a prediction, um, nevertheless. Um, listen, uh, good luck at the uh, weekend, Stephen, for uh, the, the Jambos uh, against Dundee. Uh, you'll be back with us next week. Don't forget, if you get a chance, uh, we've got the competition on our Facebook page, a chance to win uh, a great uh, prize. It's three prizes in the PLZ hat-trick competition. All you have to do is follow the process, hit the send message button and answer the question. If you get the answer right, submit your details and you could be the winner of an iPad, an Xbox and a Diego Maradona canvas. Um, he's another man that some people think is the world's greatest ever player. Um, all three prizes, all in one. All you have to do is make sure you register your details after you get uh, the correct answer. Good luck with that. Like, share and follow us on our Facebook. Hit the red button on the YouTube if you get a chance. We'll be back tomorrow. Uh, Ruffy and myself with Tam McManus and Charlie Adam. God willing, he's getting better and better as we speak. Uh, he was that sick that he told the white van not to come to his house to deliver the cash, Stephen. That's how mm. sick he was. It was incredible. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That sums it up. Thanks to Ruffy. Thanks to Hugh. Thanks to Nasey. And myself, Peter Marston. Thanks to you for watching. Expect.